Hello everyone, I'm Jeff Jeffers. The first Notre Dame football game ever played occurred in 1887 when a group of students from the University of Michigan took the train to South Bend to help introduce the sport to students here on the Notre Dame campus. That contest ended 8-0 in favor of the guests from Michigan. After the contest, the Michigan players were fed, they got back on the train and returned to Ann Arbor. The football lesson was learned quite well. Notre Dame was successful in football during the early years, then became nationally known under coach Newt Rockney. It is somewhat ironic that it was during Rockney's worst season ever that he spoke the lines that have become as famous as any words associated with sport. We begin our look at the greatest comeback victories in Notre Dame football history as the Irish win one for the Gipper. Rockney's first team had a record of 3-1-2. and two. Only six games were played because of the United States' involvement in World War I. After the 1918 season, the Irish under Rockney went 75-7-2 until 1928. In that year, Notre Dame split its first four games, then won the next two. The seventh game was the traditional contest against Army. The cadets had won six straight games and were led by consensus All-America Chris Cagle. The 1928 Irish squad was not without talent, but Rockney had had almost a complete turnover of players from the 1927 squad. A record of 4-2 with three games remaining would hardly be cause for criticism, but Rockney was receiving more than his fair share. Had he lost his touch, was the magic gone? But the coach was also a master in the use of psychology, and Rockney had a plan. None of the players in the Notre Dame locker room personally knew George Gipp, but all were aware of what he had done for Notre Dame. Gipp was the first glamour player for Notre Dame. He did everything one could possibly do on a football field, and do it effortlessly. He led Notre Dame in scoring, passing, and rushing from 1918 through 1920. Yet for all of Gipp's excellence on the field, it was what happened in December of 1920 that has made him a permanent part of American sports history. Two weeks after being named to Walter Camp's All-America team, Gipp came down with strep throat. The medical advances that seem commonplace today in treating such a condition were merely ideas in the 1920s. On December 14th, George Gipp died at St. Joseph's Hospital in South Bend. His coach was at his bedside. Nearly eight years later in the visitor's locker room at Yankee Stadium, Rockney recalled what Gipp had said. Players were told that Gipp had made a last request of his coach. According to Rockney, Gipp knew the end was near. I've got to go, Rock, but it's all right. I'm not afraid. Sometime, Rock, when the team is up against it, when things are wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, tell them to go in there with all they've got and win just one for the Gipper. I don't know where I'll be then, Rock, but I'll know about it, and I'll be happy. Rockney told his team that Gip had specifically asked for a win over Army. That day had come, and this was the team. Notre Dame did not go out and whip Army. In fact, the cadets held a 6-0 lead in the third quarter. Jack Chevney tied the score with a one-yard plunge. As he was pulled to his feet, Chevney reportedly shouted, that's one for the Gipper. But the Irish would need one more. Chevney was injured as Notre Dame was moving the ball in the last quarter. Bill Drew went into the game for the injured running back, and Johnny O'Brien replaced John Colrick at left end. O'Brien was a track man at Notre Dame and had never seen action for the football team. With the ball in Army's 32-yard line, left halfback Butch Nimick Heaved the ball toward the end zone. O'Brien made the catch on the 10 and took it in for the winning touchdown. O'Brien and the Irish had scored another for the Gipper. As the Irish celebrate, Chris Cagle returns to kick off 55 yards. He has played the entire game and now lies exhausted at the 10. He has to be carried from the field. Army pushes the ball to the 1 before time expires and Notre Dame is victorious. To this day, many fans of Army football believe the officials in the game were also caught up in the spirit of Rockney and George Gipp. Final score, Notre Dame 12, Army 6. There always have been and always will be questions, even to this day, as to the absolute truth concerning Rockney and his Gipper speech. The deathbed scene was the highlight of the movie New Rockney All-American. Pat O'Brien played Rockney and Ronald Reagan portrayed George Gipp. And throughout his life, the 40th president of the United States was more than happy to once again play the Gipper. What happened to the Irish of 1928? The next week, Carnegie Tech beat Notre Dame in South Bend. 
That was the first home loss at Cartier Field since 1905. And USC finished off the season trouncing Notre Dame in Los Angeles on December 1st. Ah, but the next year, Notre Dame went 9-0 and and claimed the national title. And as for the words of George Gipp, they remain an indelible presence here on the wall of the Irish locker room at Notre Dame Stadium. A reminder of what happens when the team believes in the spirit of Notre Dame. Notre Dame was the only school where New Rockney coached. But as author Murray Sperber relates in his book, Shake Down the Thunder, many other schools constantly courted the Irish coach and Rockney loved the attention. From Loyola in California to Minnesota to Columbia in New York City, Rockney was the hottest ticket when a coaching vacancy occurred. One school that went hard after Rockney was the Ohio State University. And for a time, the attraction was mutual. Rockney, though, decided to stay at Notre Dame, build a new stadium, and continue the excellence of the program. But the era of Rockney ended on March 31, 1931, when he died in a plane crash. The university elevated Hunk Anderson from an assistant coaching job to the head coaching position. Anderson coached two years, then gave way to Elmer Layden. The fullback of the famed Four Horsemen backfield reached the pinnacle of his coaching tenure on November 2, 1935, when the Irish journeyed to Columbus to take on the Buckeyes. This was the game for which Notre Dame fans had long awaited. Ohio State was a juggernaut and had throttled each opponent. The coach of the Buckeyes, Francis Schmidt, was nicknamed Francis Closed the Gates of Mercy Schmidt due to his team's dominance. For 45 minutes at the famed Horseshoe Stadium, the game teetered on being a rout in favor of the Scarlet Scourge. 81,000 fans see the Buckeyes jump to a 13-0 lead after three quarters. But in the final 15 minutes, Notre Dame plays a quarter of football that is remembered to this very day. After scoring to begin the fourth quarter, the Irish defense holds and the offense is again moving the ball. But Steve Miller fumbles in the end zone and the Buckeyes recover. Now Ohio State marches down the field, eating up precious time and yardage concurrently. With three minutes remaining in the game, Notre Dame begins an 80-yard drive. Andy Pilney begins to gain chunks of yardage on the ground. He then passes to Mike Layden, the brother of the Irish coach, for a 33-yard score. The extra point is missed again. Ohio State 13, Notre Dame 12. Notre Dame tries an onside kick, but Ohio State recovers. All the Buckeyes need to do is run out the remaining time on the clock, and the highly partisan crowd would leave happy. Dick Belts runs the ball into the Irish line off right tackle, but fumbles. In 1935, the team that touches the ball last before it goes out of bounds gains possession. Notre Dame now has the ball in the Buckeyes 49. The crowd is becoming frantic. Irish fans, their emotion bottled for nearly the entire day, sense the ultimate comeback. The Buckeye faithful is now tied in a collective knot as the OSU defense is back on the field. Pilney retreats to throw, but no receiver is open. He heads up field on a tremendous broken field run. Ohio State forces him out of bounds on the 19. Pilney remains down. He suffers torn cartilage on the play in his knee and is carried to the Irish sideline. Bill Shakespeare comes into the game with 30 seconds remaining. His surname and the drama that will surround him is not lost in the horde of national media that is on hand to cover the game. Shakespeare throws for the score, but the ball heads straight for Dick Belts. The Ohio State player who fumbled the ball earlier now drops a sure interception that would have iced the game for OSU. Layden shuttles in another quarterback. It's Jim McKenna. He got to Columbus by sneaking on the team train. He had no ticket for the game and talked his way into the Irish locker room. Layden let him suit up, but McKenna forgot to bring shoulder pads. McKenna takes the play to the Notre Dame huddle. Shakespeare fires another pass toward Wayne Milner. The All-America has drawn single coverage and the ball is perfectly thrown. Milner makes the catch and the comeback is complete. 18-13 after the extra point is missed. Irish fans pour out of the stands to